You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. You've had a long day at work, and you can't wait to just get home, take off your shoes, plop yourself down in your favorite chair, and relax. Ah. You walk up to your tranquil residential home and your neatly manicured lawn in your quiet suburban neighborhood, put the key in the lock, open the door, and... Yes, the pets have gone wild! What were you thinking? Welcome to the show about everything you always wanted to know about exotic pets. Where to get them, what to feed them, and how to care for them. You'll even find out why some people live with a monkey. Now, here's your host, exotic pet expert and author, Bob Tart. Hey, Bob, what were you thinking? Hi. Hi. I'm Bob Tart, author of the book's Enslaved by Ducks and Foul Weather. And I'm Bill Holm, uh, driving today, and uh, a character in Bob's books, Enslaved by Ducks and Foul Weather, and a third one soon to come. That's right. Uh, I'm here with book character Bill Holm, and we are in an automobile. And we're not doing a pet show today, but we are doing, of course, an animal show, because this is what were you thinking, and we're thinking of you, our listener. I was always thinking of our listeners. It is January 30th. It is a wonderful 21 degrees Fahrenheit outdoors. Boy, I wish that was centigrade outside, don't you, Bill? <laughs> that would make a big difference. Oh. What would it be? What would it... Uh, 300 degrees, oh, yeah. something like that. We are speeding across the Michigan continent in search of... A bird called a crossbill. A crossbill? Yes, we're going across Michigan in search of a crossbill. Well, I don't quite understand why we're going all that way to find a crossbill. Well, I know you're a little cross sometimes, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all you have to do is look at the driver. Yes, we are also looking for red poles and siskins. I've been bird watching, or birding as the pros like to call it, for just a just a few years now, and I, th I think you too, right, Bill? Oh, absolutely. And I Just always, a few. I always had the impression that you would do birding in the summer and in the spring and fall during migration time. I never imagined that the wintertime presented the opportunity to see birds that you wouldn't ordinarily see in the temperate months. Like what? Well, common visitors to our feeders are juncos. I believe they're called dark-eyed juncos. And what about the slate-colored junco? That might be an older name for the same bird. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And also American tree sparrows. But there are other birds that come down from Canada in the winter. I've seen a snowy owl before, and that's generally a, a Canadian bird. This year... Crossbills have been winging their way south. Now, well, they commonly come in the winter looking for what? Well, crossbills live way, 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 way up north in Canada in the boreal forest. Where's that? That's way, 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 way up in Canada. Oh, okay. That seems like a long ways to be way, 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 way up north. Yeah, I, I could be wrong about that. I, I think it's, I, I, now that you mention it, way, 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 way up north would be past the boreal forest. I think it would be above the tree line. So I guess they're not way, 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 way up north in Canada. <clears throat> I guess they generally live way, 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 way up north. So what happens in the winter time is that they are what is called an eruptive species. An eruptive species? Yes. Hmm. I know how it feels. Well, no, you are disruptive, not eruptive. Oh, oh. And what happens is that they run out of food up north, so they wing their way south, and they find food to eat here. This has been a major eruptive year for crossbills, mostly white-winged crossbills, but a few red crossbills as well. And Bill and I are going to try and see them because they seem to be fairly common in the eastern part of the state right now, but we're not seeing any in West Michigan. I haven't seen a single crossbill, Bill. <laughs> Until this 
trip. Yeah. <clears throat> crossbills are unusual looking. The white winged crossbill that we're looking for is a reddish bird, but it has white wing bars. You know about wing bars, don't you, Bill? I've wung my way through many a bar. I think you have indeed. And I think you're a little bit drunk right now, even though it's uh, 9.37 in the morning. It, the, I deny. Hmm? Well, you can deny it, but... <clears throat> the, the crossbills have an unusual beak that crosses in front. The tips of the beak don't meet. They overlap in sort of a cross. So those bills are adapted to eating seeds from pine cones. Why would a beak shaped like that be any advantage with a pine cone? It seems like it would, it would be awkward and get in the way no matter what you were going for. That is a very good question and I'm glad you raised it. Now today we're going to Chelsea. Chelsea? Chelsea, Michigan. When I woke up it was a Chelsea morning and the first thing that I heard was... Linda? Linda. Why are we going to Chelsea particularly rather than someplace else in the state? Well, I'm on a birding list serve, a mailing list, and there's just lots of these birds. In fact, one friendly fellow reported seeing lots of crossbills right in his cul-de-sac. No kidding. Yeah. So we're headed there first, and we're taking you with us, and uh, if you stay with us, that is. Do you have a key to this guy's place? I, no, no, we're just going to be tramping through his yard. Oh. So we hope that he doesn't have a neighbor with a shotgun. I, I agree. Completely. And if, if we don't find the birds around there, he's given us a couple other locations okay. where we can look. Now I mentioned if you stay with us this long, and the reason I say that is, Bill, do you remember a show that you and I did together last year? Uh, refresh my memory. Well, I've repressed it, but uh, we did a show together where you took over What Were You Thinking? Oh, that's right. And it is the only, I think this is show number 30 or something like that, it is the only episode of What Were You Thinking I ever did that garnered a listener complaint. Really? Well, it's yes. not surprising, really, is it? No, no, it isn't. Would you like to talk a little bit about, Bill and I have uh, been friends for 30 years? That's about right. Would you like to mention the history of our collaborations. Well, let's see. What was the last one we did? It would be the uh, Beat Magazine. The Beat Magazine, that's right. And uh, I assumed the position for one issue of guest editor so that I could edit a column by a columnist. Other than Bob. Bob has a, you see, Bob has a column. The Beat is a music... A, well, go ahead. I was going to say, The Beat is a music magazine that comes out of Los Angeles. Exactly. And I have a column in it called Techno Beat, reviewing world music. Uh -huh. And Bill Holm, in a disagreeable aspect of his personality called The Whale, was a guest mm. in the column occasionally. And he was fairly popular. And you would actually write some of the whale parts. You would, I would play some CDs and then... Bill, yeah, I'd comment as the whale. As the whale would comment in an ignorant sort of manner on the on the CDs. Uh-huh, that's right. And the whale was initially popular. Popular enough that my editor, C.C. Smith, asked the whale to guest edit London writer Dave Hucker's column. Oh, you're going to mention him by name. Okay. Dave Hucker. Uh-huh. He'll never listen to this show. <laughs> so... What do you recall? What you did with Dave's column? Well, it was very he it, it was very poorly written. It was done in haste. He said he did it on the tarmac while waiting to fly to Zanzibar or something like that. That's exactly right. And uh, and so it was very sketchy and very hard to follow, and just didn't make any sense at all. And so I went and I so I pointed all those things out as you know I as the whale in bold type as the I think it might have been even as myself. Okay, but it might have been the whale. So but in any event, it, it was just, you, I thought I was being funny, but I think maybe he took it a little personal. Well, I thought it was funny, too, but there'd be like a paragraph by Hucker, and then there would be a couple lines of comments by Bill Holm. Yeah, or and the whale. the response was not positive. The no. uh, Beat magazine actually got three letters, which were forwarded to me by my editor, of readers saying it's bad enough that the whale is in Bob's column. If it's going to take over the whole magazine, mm -hmm. they're going to cancel their subscription. Exactly. So that's our track record together. That's the last time 
that I appeared that I did any uh, guest editing. Did in you the Beat Magazine? Did you want to mention the? Um, we had a collaboration in Grand Rapids Magazine too. That's right, and I was managing editor. I had an idea that uh, was very funny, and it ended up um, poking fun at various local things. And one of them was the uh, Circle in the Park Theater, which was you know local um, theater, and uh, it, and it was funny. But they didn't take it. They didn't take it as a joke. They took it very seriously, and they called me and threatened to um, have all the arts organizations in Grand Rapids withdraw their advertising from Grand Rapids Magazine in a boycott based on that one joke that Bob wrote. I don't think, and the joke was it was little icons for the TV. Are you like the trying I to explain it? Well, no, I won't bother. No, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <clears throat> no, it's, it's not even much of a joke. They were, it was based on the little symbols you see in the corner of the screen about what kind of weather it is, like thunderstorm or tornado or whatever that is. So we thought, why not do other symbols for other community circumstances and events? So I had, a sim I had an icon of someone holding their hands over their ears, and it was a warning that Circle in the Park Theater was performing Evita. Actually, as you'll recall, it was a map of South America that had an ice pack on it, on its head, and a thermometer sticking out of its mouth. So it might have been even more My insulting. recollection, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then it said Evita is, yeah. So um, they didn't like, but, but the boycott never materialized. No, it never did happen. No, because really, where else were they going to advertise except the press? Okay, so we're going to hit the road again, and uh, before we land in Chelsea, Michigan, we're going to listen to the sound of a crossbill so that we know what they sound like. Well, maybe we can, uh, let's see, did I leave the uh, CD? No. Uh, no, okay. Well, we, we can <laughs> fill while you find the CD. That's all right. We'll, we'll do that when we, um, we're going to stop again probably, so, um, well, hang on. So just before we take off, uh, we're going to listen to the Stokes CD, which uh, has examples of what the Red Cross Bill and White Wing Cross Bill sound like. And that's because we might have to find them by ear. Which I, I think, by the way, by the way, I think that is a travesty that that you can identify a bird simply by hearing it. I mean, it, you could say you heard anything, and you know, who's going to say you didn't? That's right. That's that's a good point. And um, um, well, it's a point, maybe not a good one. So let, let's let's hear what this bird sounds like. Red crossbill. Well, it sounds just like a man. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, that should be easy to identify. Well, that's funny. Our parrot sounds kind of like that. Ah. Let, let's see if the man says anything else. Well, that's just a bunch of random sounds. I can't identify that from anything else. Huh. Okay, well, I guess we're just on our own. What's that one again? That was the Red Cross bill. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> that's what we're looking for? Well, we're also looking... White-winged cross bill. Well, it sounded like a man again. It did, but it's very much like the last one. So maybe it won't, won't be so easy. So we'll be listening for both of those, and I'm going to remind you, if you're still with us, that we are at the halfway point in What Were You Thinking? And you're listening to Bob Tart and book character Bill Holm, and we are wending our way across Michigan, the continent of Michigan, looking for the White Wing Cross Bill and the Red Wing Cross Bill. And we are now going to leave you, and there will be a word from our sponsor. <laughs> What Were You Thinking? We'll be right back after Bob gets the ducks out of his living room. Don't go away. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Hey. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in Paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. 
For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. world. Ladies and gentlemen, Pet Life Radio proudly presents DSPN, the Dog Sports and Performance Network. Get ready to unleash the dog sports enthusiast in all of us. From speed drawing and mushing to racing, agility, and competition, this is the place to learn all about the dog sports and activities that you can do with your furry best friend and canine competitor. So get ready for game time. DSPN with your host, Lori Williams. Every week, on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, ducks are in the pond, rabbits in his hutch, and monkeys... Oh, in my car! Oh, okay, well, I go check my insurance policy. We'll turn you back over to Bob. Hi, this is Bob Tart. Welcome back to What Were You Thinking? This is a show about Bill Holm and I looking for crossbills, red poles, and pine siskins. Uh, sitting back here at home listening to the field recordings... I realize that the uh, second half of the show makes even less sense than the first half, so I need to uh, fill in a little bit and uh, set up the uh, little snippets of field recording. So this first bit you're going to hear, this is after a two-hour drive when we first got to Chelsea and we parked right in front of my friend's house and just got out of the car and then you will hear what happens. Bill? Well, we just arrived and I'm hearing pine siskins right above us. You're kidding. Nope, there's pine siskins. So that's one of our target birds. Don't see any crossbills yet. But, Wait, which um, is the pine siskin? I heard them. Oh. I think it's those birds right up there. Wow. At least uh, pine siskins are among them. I now I'm hearing so. a bird that sounds like a dog barking. And really distinct. Yeah. Dog it, sound. It, it must be one of the uh, mimic birds, like a uh, minor bird. Uh -huh. or a parrot. But anyway, those are definitely um, siskins up there, so I'm going to grab my binoculars. Maybe it's a, a cross-voice bird. Oh, could be. I'm going to grab my binoculars and look. Okay. Hi, back in the studio, Bob here again. So, I was hearing the pine siskins, but they were straight up in a tree with a bright sky behind them, so I didn't get a look at them. So what we did was we followed the instructions of the homeowner who had emailed me and um, given me lots of places to find the birds and we had walked on a little path that ran alongside his garage and there was a bird feeder and instead of just one or two siskins there was a cloud of them there was a huge flock and I was very happy to find siskin it's a very attractive bird if you're looking at it through a dirty window on a feeder or <laughs> dirty glasses maybe it um has a certain resemblance to what a goldfinch looks like in the winter, although its back is streaked black over olive, or at least dark over olive. But you can't miss it if you see the breast, because the breast is really heavily streaked, and there's a little bit of patch of yellow on the wing. So that's what's going on in, in this scene. Okay, here we are. I think you can hear some birds. And siskins are all around us, or at least in front of us. And Bill... Did you see that common red pole? I sure did. So that's the thing that had the red thing on its head? Yes, that's the thing that had a red thing on its head. And there he is. And that's another bird we were looking for. So now we only have to find the crossbills. Then we can go home and just say forget it to all this standing out in the cold. As you heard from that little snippet, I was quite pleased not only to see the pine siskins, but also to see one common red pole among them. Common red pole, it's another, another little finch. It's a streaked bird, sort of like the pine siskin, although its back is lighter colored with brown streaks. And the males have just a little bit of a red blush on their, or underneath their neck. 
it's uh, I, I guess you could say almost a, a little bib with a red blush. But the really telltale characteristic is that it has a little rust-colored cap on the top of the head. So after seeing the common red pole, we still hadn't seen the crossbills. So following the email instructions, we set out down the hill. We are looking for a small grove of spruce trees where the crossbills were supposed to be pretty reliable. So that's what you're going to hear next. So we are walking down the hill in substantial snow and one of the problems is that the directions that we have seem to um, presume that we know one tree from another. And Bill, what are we looking for? Um, a deer path and spruces. It's deer path and spruces. We haven't and seen the crossbills and that's what we're looking oh. for. I see a stand of spruce ahead huh? and I also see many opportunities to drop the mp3 recorder in the snow. Well, what would you say the temperature is, Bill? About 14 below zero. Yeah, it's quite cold and quite snowy, but we're going to persevere because we want to see the crossbills. Hi, Studio Bob here again. As you could tell from the quavering of my voice, it was pretty darn cold out there and it didn't seem like a long way to walk, but there was snow to trudge through, branches to duck under, tree stumps to walk over and of course the fact that I am simply out of condition. So we got we got very chilly while we were out there. We walked to the spruces and we didn't see a thing. So it it seemed logical just to give up because that's the kind of guy I am and uh, so is Bill. So we made our way back through the woods up the hill to uh, our friend's house and I thought well I would take one last look at the pine siskins and one last look at the common red pole. But then I also decided to look, at, of course, as the email had asked us to do, was to look at the spruce trees right next to the feeder. And I looked at them for a while, and suddenly something good happened. Well, boy, we just saw something pretty spectacular. Yeah, I wasn't sure that uh, that was a crossbill we were seeing. I saw a bird that was hanging upside down in the pine tree eating pine cones and that should have been enough that could have been a kinglet yeah, yes i was afraid that it was uh i i don't really i i'm embarrassed to say that we're looking for birds that i hardly even know what they look like mm -hmm. but uh it was quite streaked on the underside and um, you saw well i noticed that it was sitting on a wire and i looked at it got a really nice look at it through my binoculars and you it brought was... binoculars <laughs> no i'm just kidding but i saw yellow down the front of it, like it had a yellow chest, and I said, Bob, it's got yellow on it, on and a I yellow said, chest, and you really didn't respond. I said, what wire? <laughs> right, what wire? But anyway, we got back in the car after the uh, wife of the uh, gentleman who owns the house drove up and... Mm. Um, caught us. Caught us, but um, she was very nice, Fortunately, very we had gracious. left the house by then. Yeah, yeah, we... Uh, I wiped my fingerprints off the walls oh, and the good. light switches. Good. But um, anyway, we checked the book when we got back to the car, and indeed, that was, and those were, crossbills that we saw. Yeah, which is what we came to see, really. So here, as Bill pointed out, we did not have to walk all the way down and follow the deer trail. We had to follow the deer trail. And it was, you know, it's nice to get out in the, in the, but it's cold out. It's bitterly cold. And so by the time we got back and got by where we were and realized we didn't have to make that trek through the snow to see the crossbills... So all we had to do was stand Just in the stand driveway. Right there, stand in the yeah. driveway. So I was hoping for four species. We're not done yet, but I was hoping for... What else did you see? Well, I was hoping for common red pole, and we saw that. Mm -hmm. I was hoping for pine siskin, and we saw that. And I was hoping for white wing crossbill, and we saw that. Mm -hmm. I would also like to see a red crossbill, but mm -hmm. how would I know if I saw it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Right. But we're going to go to one other spot after we eat at... Uh, China Garden in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to one other spot and then spot, and then maybe we will see both kinds of crossbills. Well, we can only hope. Okay. This is our last stop of the day because it's getting to be 12.38 p.m. I'm getting a little tired. It's about nap time. We are at Cedar Lake Outdoor Center near the village of Waterloo, and the sign here says Cedar Lake Outdoor Center a cooperative effort between and so that's where we are and there's lots of spruce trees right here at the entrance 
and I don't see any birds, but we'll walk in a little bit and... It's still pretty cold out there, though. Yeah, maybe... And we're parked in a place where it says, no parking, and there's a tow truck towing our car away. I think that's if you're a little further up. Oh, okay. We're but I mean, there's it, it, we don't know yet if we're going to be able to get out of here because the snow is deep in this little parking lot, which is unplowed. Yeah, so we may be here long enough to see crossbills and even flamingos when the <laughs> climate change comes. So uh, we're going we're gonna to take a look. Hi, this is Studio Bob intruding for the last time on this show. I wanted to point out uh, just three things very quickly. The, the thing I really want to stress, which makes this show less exciting than you know watching paint dry, as the saying goes, is that it is usually not this easy to see your target birds. It was... Uh, as if they were handed to us on a silver platter, the fact that we saw, you know, vir virtually all three, the, the the red poles, the siskins, and the crossbills <laughs> in my friend's driveway. Uh, uh, my friend's name is Dave. I'll, I'll stop just referring to him as, as my friend. So we, we saw all three in Dave's driveway, and, and that really is extraordinary. The only other time I've seen target birds so easily was last spring when I was lucky enough to be invited down to Florida for a, a workshop and I saw 30 new birds. That that shows you how pathetic my life list is that one trip to Florida would add 30 birds. So I want to point that out quickly. Also, as you will hear in the conclusion to the show, we were not successful seeing crossbills at Cedar Lake even though Dave had told us that it was tough to miss them. And the reason we didn't see them is because I had foolishly ignored Dave's instructions. I, I read his email and concentrated on the part about where to walk around his house and then folded it up and stuck it in his pocket. And it completely slipped my mind that Dave had given us very specific instructions where to go at Cedar Lake to see the birds, and I completely disregarded it. So the last thing I want to say is... You will hear us conclude the show, thank everybody, and sign off. And I'd like to ask you, please stay with the show even after it's ended because there's sort of a surprise conclusion. I know it's it's painful, but, you know, if you've stuck with the show this long, just hang in there a little while longer. And, and there is a pretty funny payoff. So thanks so much. And here we go back to Bob and Bill in the field. Well, we mm. dipped on the cross bills at Cedar Lake. Very disappointing. I would say we trekked a good eighth of a mile in. Oh, easy. Easy an eighth. And if you can't see a bird within an eighth of a mile, because to sum up, if there's one thing I learned at our birder friend's house in Chelsea, it's that you really shouldn't have to go far to see birds. Right. You should be able to just take one or two steps outside your vehicle. Or not even leave your vehicle. And be able to see all the birds you want. Mm hmm In a larger sense, though. Upon reflection, large as well. what is a bird? Oh. What is a man? <laughs> one flies on wings of feathers. One flies on wings of dreams. Of dreams. Which is which? I'm not sure we always know the difference. Descartes once said, I think, therefore I am. But shouldn't it really be, I think, therefore I go to Chelsea? To look for white wing crossbills? I, I think badly. I'm a poor thinker. Therefore, I, I travel all the way across the state in the snow and the 12 degree temperatures to, uh, to see something that probably I could have seen probably within 50 yards of my own house. It's possible. Mm -hmm. It's possible that we just don't know that these birds are in our own house. Well... Now, we had another uh, diversion on this trip, and that was our uh, Magellan GPS that uh, uh, Linda really, got. Yeah, it's really responsible for us being where we are now. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it did a fairly good job of navigating for us, although in Chelsea it got lost. Mm -hmm. I think maybe, I think it's possible the GPS was looking for white wing crossbills and <laughs> lost, its, lost its bearings for a minute. It stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, any final thoughts, Bill? Well, no, I'm just happy to have this opportunity to uh, to go looking for these birds. It was good to see them. It's too bad, as unfortunate, that uh, we had to actually go outside. You know, as I say, it was it was it's quite bitterly cold, 
And I also wanted to thank everyone, you know, for listening today. And I just want you to know that um, if you find anything annoying about this show at all, please let us know. We'd like to hear from you. Yeah, email me at bob at petliferadio.com. If you want to be on the show, I hope this show is a kind of an inspiration that you hear the show and you say, my gosh, they're putting any kind of garbage on it. I could be on, on the radio, show. too. Yeah, I, I could, or on, or on the, the podcast. podcast. Yeah, so... So thanks to all of you for listening. I would like to thank my producer, my poor beleaguered producer, who is probably the only individual in the country who's actually sat through this whole show because because he had to. Who was that? Our producer, Mark Winter. Oh, of course, Mark Winter. Oh. What a great guy. Yep. So, so long, everybody. Good night. Well, I thought the show was over, but as soon as Bill and I uh, walked in the door back home here... Uh, Linda came uh, running up to me, and, and what did you tell me? When I was coming back from the barn, there was a little bird on the upright feeder right by the milk house that had uh, light and dark streaking on the stomach's very delicate face. It had gray muted streaking on the head and down the back, a little bit of yellow on the wing. wasn't very afraid of me. I was like two arm lengths away from it and sat there eating. And Bob thinks that was a pine cisco. Yeah, we Bill and it did not look like a female goldfinch at all. Well, not at all. Well, I mean, the thing is, we just walked into this room here and looked out the window at the bird feeder. After driving for five and a half hours through the snow and ice, we come back here and the bird is at the bird feeder. Right. We didn't. We could have stayed here. Yeah. 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 Now, true, we wouldn't have seen the the crossbills, but but still. Pine Siskin, we drive five hours to see, mm-hmm. and I've been checking at our feeder every single day for one. Mm-hmm. We and just I've never seen one. Linda's nope, there. and we just walk in the door, and there's one outside yeah. our window. Yeah, we tried half an hour before, and there it was when I was coming back to the barn. So there you have it. They probably followed us here just to make a point, <laughs> just to make fun of us. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. Thinking about buying a monkey? How about a ferret or a skunk? Then check out the show that will answer the burning questions, where do you get them? What do you feed them? How do you take care of them? And most of all, what were you thinking? With exotic pet expert and author Bob Tart, every week on demand from PetLifeRadio.com.